Hey traders, welcome to a global macro update. At the start of the video, we're going to be going over the economic calendar. First, looking at Thursday's numbers that came out mainly for the United States. We do have the unemployment rate that was forecasted to be over 12% lower than the initial 13.3 from the previous uh, data that came out, but it actually came out to be better, more bullish than the actual forecast at under or just at 11.1%. And we have the non-farm payrolls that beat the forecast as well. Initial job loss claims actually came out to be worse, but that hasn't impacted the market nearly as much as some other major uh, news catalysts that have come out. The non-farm payrolls was absolutely huge the previous month. The unemployment rate at 13.3 was very surprising for a lot of people. So the overall economic data that is coming out from the United States is actually looking more positive. We got the PMI numbers uh, today at 1.30 here. It's still contracting, so we're still under 50, 47.7 and 47.1 for UK, but overall it's kind of getting to that 50 mark, not terrible because the previous one was 30 and 29. So we can see that the numbers are shifting in the overall economy for not just the United States, but for other countries and governments. And uh, this is kind of creating more confluence with our overall risk on sentiment that we are still completely uh, in. We are definitely have more exposure on risk on investments, assets and instruments compared to the risk off. Uh, I think kind of the only one that I am looking at is gold and silver as a potential long to the upside, which is a little bit uh, more in the risk off sentiment side, but the, basically the rest of the trade that I have on right now where I'm looking at is going to be risk on. So we're, I'm looking for global investors to seek risk and to speculate on assets so they appreciate in price. That is my outlook for this upcoming week um, unless something happens this Friday, which I don't think it will. It's around almost noon on a PST. So it's a pretty mellow Friday to end off the week. We did get some good moves. S&P had an awesome push to the upside this week, capitalized on that uh, exposure, which was great. And uh, we'll see how it goes for next week. But this Friday ended pretty positive with some good numbers for the United States and uh, better than expected numbers for the UK. A little bit on the non-farm payrolls, we see that initially we got like the worst non-farm payroll number really ever. Uh, and then now we're getting like the best non-farm payroll number ever since the 1970s. So um, yeah, this chart speaks better than I could ever express it, but we can see how much volatility is coming. So this is the max from 1970 and we can see like the worst parts of history. This is 2008, 2009, the financial crisis right here. And we can see how much it dipped. Obviously, there's lockdowns, so there's going to be a lot more people who are unemployed because basically entire malls got shut down all over the country and all around the world. So it makes sense. But now with the easing of the lockdown, people are getting back to their jobs. And I think that's why we're getting such a massive spike back up in the non-farm payrolls here. But uh, extremely bullish all around in terms of the numbers that are actually coming out. Also, we can see that this is the U.S. unemployment rate. People will think that it was going to get worse, that uh, it was going to get up to around 20%. I'm just looking to see if we can see the previous uh, historic unemployment rate, which is right here, sitting at just above 20%. So initially, when we were getting that massive push in unemployment. I was thinking that the unemployment would rise, but at the end, um, right now, we're actually seeing quite a bit of a decrease here. And at 11.1, .1, and the next one's gonna come out a little bit later, but uh, yeah, it's definitely looking a lot better. And this is just giving me a little bit more confidence in that it's a current risk on sentiment. And at this point in time, the way I'm doing the market is I'm not really paying attention to the news so much, but I'm really, really focusing on the data coming out and the actual numbers and the statistics, as well as the price action of major assets around the globe and commodities as well. So that's how I'm viewing the market and trying to understand if it's a risk on or risk off. I don't really try to look at the news too much and we'll get into why in this video. But we can see this is the initial claims 
massive spike from the initial rush and then we are getting less and less new people to file for unemployment but this is brand this is like we had 1.427 million people just file for unemployment for this week alone but what we're really paying attention to is the continued claims so this is initial this is brand new people coming in every single week but this is the continued claims meaning these are the people that have been laid off and are continuing to be laid off they can't go back to their jobs and unless this starts to fall you know people are not going back to their jobs very simple as that so that means the economy is not going to be as uh, i guess fluid or well oiled as it could be because one man's income is another man's spending so then if a lot of people are all not working there's less money to go around people are making less money they're willing to spend less so then uh, that's very that's very deflationary and for central banks they want inflation they want that two ish percent inflation on a yearly basis and we're going to talk about that right now Fed's Evans says low inflation may require more monetary easing. So we talked about this yesterday, but a lot of people, maybe some people in the retail space, they don't know as much about uh, economics or anything, but a lot of people think that there's going to be high inflation and it makes sense. Look at the Fed's balance sheet. It is absolutely ballooning, but this is not the only thing that causes inflation. There is another factor in the formula of inflation of true inflation where cpi numbers go up the cost of your average goods of uh average basket of goods and services goes up and what is needed is the increase in velocity right but i think what the people in the fed are doing is they are 100 percent dubs they love stimulus they can't stand any deflation zero they want none of that so what they're doing is is just you know, pushing the same levers, going further and further, saying that there's not enough inflation, there's not enough inflation, there's not enough inflation. I didn't think one point there's going to be a, a switch where there's going to be a switch in velocity of currency and there's going to be rising inflation. And that's going to be very difficult to tackle because let's say we start getting some inflation when things go back to normal. Okay, well, how does the Fed tackle higher inflation or rising inflation? Well, what they have to do is to raise interest rates, make it harder for people to get money, make it more expensive to borrow money. But what happens when you raise interest rates, right? The stock market absolutely falls. Look at 2018 when they raised interest rates. It absolutely fell apart. And they lower interest rates and they went back to normal again. And then when we had that COVID crash, they dropped rates to 0.25%, 25 basis points, and then we recovered. So what I'm gathering from, let's say, the past uh, Q1 and this Q2 is it's not about so much the, econ the economic health, but it's more so just how much liquidity and how easy is it to get money in the current environment we're in. And if that answer is very easy, well, the market's probably going to go on and it's a very risk on environment. It's easy for people to pay off their debts because they can just borrow more money, pay off the debts. There's a lot of zombie companies that are prevalent in the current market, right? So unless interest rates drop, if they keep on creating more monetary uh, stimulus as well as keep the interest rates at 25 basis points or even go to ZERP, zero interest rate policy, where they have zero interest rates and even potentially even negative like they do in Germany, I believe, and Japan, that could be a, that, that's a, that's a very bullish thing for the market. And that would create more risk on sentiment in my view, but it's dangerous. It's a dangerous road in my personal opinion. Uh, and we can see feds, uh, Clarida, I don't know exactly how to say this. So he doesn't see any asset bubble resulting from recent policy response to pandemics. So yeah, a lot of people in the fed are, are thinking that this is an extreme deflationary worry and more stimulus try to create inflation create aggregate demand and drop interest rates to basically zero it i don't think that they're going to be raising rates anytime in the future so as long as they're keeping rates at basically zero and it's almost free to borrow money i think that it's going to have a long lasting effect for the risk on investors because if it's really easy to borrow money for businesses and people, 
that it, it's pretty much you're borrowing money, spending money, and then it gets the gears going, which is a positive thing for the short term. But obviously, an economy can run too hot, which is inflation. And um, we already talked about what the outcome would be when and if we do start seeing the velocity of the currency increase and the actual CPI numbers go up. So we'll see how that goes. This is really just uh, uncharted territory that we're in, really. Um, not just in the Fed, but especially Japan, but uh, central banks around the world. This is really uncharted territory. So... You know, they have models, they have systems in place, but at the end of the day, they don't really know the outcome where, of where this is going. They don't know the end destination of this road. They just can see the road a few blocks away, and that's where they're headed so far, and things are looking all right, but they don't really know the actual destination. Something interesting that I read, Black Lives Matter protests haven't led to COVID-19 spikes. It may be due to the people staying at home. Um, some people think it's a complete fraud, like the of the covid pandemic and pandemic or whatever. Um, but it's interesting. Uh, when, I, when I initially saw this of the protests and, and the people, I thought it was going to be absolutely terrible. So I was expecting the cases to rise quite exponentially in the United States as well as around the world. But the riots were the worst, obviously, in the US. So I, I was expecting a lot of COVID cases to emerge or at least rise. And um, not a whole lot has happened too much. So that's pretty interesting. I'm not going to touch on that. Make your own decisions. But, but it's very interesting to see that when you have a large group of people go into, a, 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 not a secluded place, but when a large group of people comes together and people saying social distance is the best way to do it, not a lot of people got COVID. I don't know. It just makes you kind of turn your head a little bit. All right. So the next thing we're going to get into is a central bank liquidity swap. So this is basically trying to understand how much demand there is outside of the United States for the US dollar. And this is for other central banks. So what would happen if a country or, or a company in Brazil, let's say, um, is needing US dollars because they're transacting commodities on the worldwide stage and they need US dollars because that is a medium of exchange for businesses around the world, right? So because it's the world reserve currency. So what this is showing us is, is the world in need of US dollars in short. And we can see that right here. Initially, when we did have that huge spike, that was when the initial COVID uh, cases happened or when the stock market fell, liquidation event, all that stuff. And people needed US dollars quite Quite substantially back in 2009 same thing because the united states is a world reserve currency people need us dollars to transact around the world people have debts in united states dollars because they need it right and this is the dollar milkshake theory uh the potential that the us dollar could be the biggest short squeeze in the world but right now we're seeing a decrease in the bids for the us dollar so there's less desire to actually obtain United States dollars. So there's less demand, which is making overall sense because the DXY, the US dollar currency index is going down. A lot of currencies that are paired with US dollar are going down as well. So out of basically all currencies, I'm just looking at, right, at it right now. Almost every single currency is doing better than the United States dollar when you compare it to the Japanese. Yeah. Odds, CHF, Euro, GBP, Canadian, all doing better than the US dollar. So the US dollars weakening quite substantially and we'll look at the dxy here in a little bit to understand the price action that the dxy is actually forming and potentially looking for a next leg down and what that actually means to the other assets that we're trading all right so that is the fundamental side of the video we're not going to get too far into it we're now going to get into all the different charts that we're going to go into just going to close off the tabs here. Also, if you have any questions about any of the stuff that we're talking about, don't hesitate to uh, put them in the question section. Let's just go like this because we do try to provide good analysis and try to do it in an educational way so you actually learn. All right. So now that we've gone through that, let's go right into the charts here. Just going to quickly look at the questions that I don't see. Uh, good point. Newbies, is the screen frozen? Nope, the screen's not frozen. So you can look on YouTube. It's going to be a lot clearer. 
to see the overall screen, but if you're just on TikTok, you can do that as well, but mainly it's just my voice that you would be listening to if it was TikTok. So let's always start with the S&P 500, and something interesting, I was just drawing some stuff off last night, and initially, we did not have this zone, so let's get rid of that. Initially, we did not have this zone, we did not have this trend line or this projection zone. So initially we just had that and then we had an ascending trend line connect the low to the high. It broke a little bit and then we had a nice mid-range zone right here. So that was the initial structure that we had yesterday that we talked about. And I added this stuff in because of a couple reasons. And we'll first go on the daily because that gives us a good perspective of why we put the two lines there. And let's take a picture here so we have a good understanding of what's happening. All right, so obviously this is a daily, so every chart or every candle represents a single day's worth of trading. We can see that we were had we had a resistance here, and then this especially, right here, this was all type B candle closes, meaning the candle closed right at the level and not the wick. So we got a lot of type B candle closes at this level for a resistance, came back down, made a higher low, holding this ascending zone, and then we pushed to make a new higher high. And when we are looking at a smaller time frame, let's just zoom right in here. We can really, really see, and let's get our brush right here. We were able to hold all along here with just wicks above the zone. But what we got here is now the candle closed above the zone, and now we're respecting it as a new level of support on the daily time frame, which is very significant. And we can also see a type B turn to support, and then we see one, two, three rejects for a resistance for a descending zone. So that creates for me a potential symmetrical triangle with a descending zone, which is an extremely well respected. We're looking also at the horizontal zones, but the ascending zone of support is well respected as well. Resistance turn one, two, three, four, five levels of support. So overall, it looks really good. It looks very well respected. We did break the wick high there closing above the wick high, the type B closures, and now it does look like we are holding as a new level of support. So let's now go into a smaller time frame and discuss this a little bit in greater detail. So when we aren't actually on the smaller time frames, it does look like the price is not able to break above this zone. We can see when we're actually looking at the smaller time frame, this is the key level of resistance. So what we're gonna be looking for is a break above this zone, but the fact that we are now above this gives a high probability for this to be a possibility, in my personal opinion. So if that is the case, what you're looking for is candle closures above this previous resistance at 3160. So you're looking for candle closures above that zone. And once you see the validation of new support from previous resistance, that's a good opportunity, in my opinion, to continue the momentum, momentum upwards. You do have a key level of resistance where we rejected very significantly right here. But from here to here is a decent space that could run for a couple days, which could uh, warrant us to be looking for some risk on exposure to carry the momentum upwards. So right now, we're in this consolidation. This is a no trade zone because we want to see what it does if it goes back into the range. We'd be looking for a potential break of here, where then we got a space from here to the horizontal zone. Or if we break to the upside, like we said, we got a potential higher high, higher low entrance, and then you get a little bit of a move up to the next level of possible resistance, which is a pretty important zone when we do look back at the previous time frames key level of support 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 turning into a new level of resistance at 3228 let's say so we got a decent amount of space there if you are looking for a potential trade on the pullback here that's a really decent opportunity if you are looking at it just maybe like this 2.3 2.5 and then if it does go above that that's great but um we got a pretty decent move that could play out right here. So let's go to a two hour chart. And it's still holding there, it would be really nice. If we even got a descending wedge here, you got a nice descending wedge right here with this is going to be a support zone. So if you're able to hit this one more time, and you're able to create a descending wedge, that would be phenomenal because that would be the impulse push the pullback is a nice price action pattern given giving us a continuation structure to the upside where we have an edge trading. So we'll see how it goes. 
Not a whole lot. I don't think it's going to break on this Friday. So we're going to wait until next week to see what it does. But if it starts moving to the upside and gains some bids in the market, especially when it breaks out here and maybe at the 3160 mark, I think that's a good continuation pattern for a potential risk on move. That could be uh, captured in my personal view. But I think this Friday is going to be a bit of a no trade day um, in terms of the S&P just because... We're squeezing, there's nothing really to be trading. We're just right in a tight volatile, tight uh, lack of volatile space that I wanna see break before I look to enter. All right, so that is the S&P. Let's zoom out here. This Friday is not too crazy, so it's gonna be a lot of what happened yesterday. Russell 2000, same story as yesterday, not really anything to add to it. We're still holding the ascending trend line as well as the potential head and shoulders that we do have if we do get a move to the downside so let's make that green and go like that and we'll see how it goes so nothing really on the russell 2000 nasdaq broke to new highs and is retesting the previous resistance as a new level of support let's just quickly draw in the highs yeah, it's a nice little resistance here from the two highs for the third touch. So no surprise that there is a little bit of resistance there. And it does look like we are squeezing a little bit from the ascending zone from on the, I guess, two ascending zones when we zoom out. So this is the long-term ascending trend line that we have been holding since April of this year. And then we just have a nice potential. Well, I guess it's validated at this point, but a resistance zone. So we are slowly squeezing but the trend is definitely to the upside. And like I said before, if you're looking to short anything, the NASDAQ is not gonna be it. Uh, the NASDAQ's probably gonna be the one thing that you're looking to long if you wanna long any index, because it's just absolutely mooning compared to basically every index in the world, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, all right, so this is now gonna be looking at the VIX. This is the volatility index of the S&P 500. When volatility is decreasing, it's usually a risk on sentiment and when volatility is increasing people are fearful people are worried people are uncertain and it's usually a risk off sentiment so right now we are dropping we blew through the support zone to the downside and we are getting some level of hesitation but obviously the momentum's to the downside and i think we could just see a fade here within the vix as long as the smp is slowly chugging along which is overall a risk on environment so equity crypto uh, those are the types of things that you're wanting to be looking to long. So overall, on this Friday to end the week, it does look like we are in a nice risk on environment for the upcoming week here on Monday. But we're not done with the global macro update yet. We are going to be looking at some global equities here right now. So this is the daily chart on all of them. Yep. And then we can see that UK's FTSE 100. Well, first off, has not bounced nearly as aggressive or has gained any bid volume compared to, let's say, for example, the DAX or the Japanese Nikkei 225. So the FTSE is definitely relatively weak compared to a lot of these other indexes. And we can see we're just consolidating here between an ascending zone, a descending zone, which is an extremely well respected. Let's just go like that. And a horizontal zone. The, hor the horizontal zone is pretty well respected. So if it breaks below that, that's going to be a pretty big indication that we could see some more bearish action soon to come for the FTSE 100. But right now, it's not looking too bad. We got a nice ascending zone that's still holding the price up, making higher lows. And we also have that same zone in confluence with this zone right here, which we'll just make in green as well. So we got a decent amount of support right here. If it does break below it, we want to see a candle closure below the zone. But if it does occur, that would be a potential risk off sentiment. And we'd be looking for potential shorts uh, in equities. But I think a lot of these are going to be in confluence. So if one breaks, I think a lot of these are going to be going in similar directions. Although right now the UK's FTSE 100 looks a lot more weak compared to things like the DAX, which is the German exchange, which is actually making a potential higher high from the previous consolidation if it does break above it right here. Yeah, it did make a bit of a newer high, newer higher high from this one, but we are just consolidating sideways. And a lot of these indexes have very similar or if not the exact same structures. 
All right, next thing we're gonna be looking at is the bonds and then a little bit of the US dollar index. Quick look at bonds, not a whole lot has happened. We're just consolidating. We did pick back up, so we were going down a little bit. So the yield of the five year was moving down, meaning that global investors were rushing into the bonds, reducing the yield because you need less incentive for investors to jump in. But the bond yields are then rising a little bit more here, going back into the trading range. So not a whole lot to talk about for the bonds. And the US dollar weakening yet again making this 97.68 zone extremely key for the sellers. And we made a high, lower high, lower high, previous support, new level of resistance. So it's definitely looking like we're in a clear, clear downtrend. But we are holding a nice ascending zone. So this could be classified as an ascending wedge or an ascending triangle, depending on if you want to value this as a horizontal zone or as a potential ascending zone. We do have three validations and three rejections of of each zone so we could classify it as either one we'd like but because of the momentum being to the downside i'm going to be looking at this more of an ascending wedge structure to continue the momentum to the downside we're looking for the crack in the ascending zone to carry the momentum back so then we're looking at potential trades and equities we're looking at potential trades in gold and silver and well as crypto so the dollar is pretty interesting to look at and i think it's going to get weaker here in the short term Definitely looks like it. We're, we're seeing a lot of topping, a double top here, failed to break to a new high in the end of June. And now we're seeing a pretty bearish structure with a series of lower lows and lower highs. So if it breaks this ascending zone, I do expect uh, gold, silver, uh, crypto to be doing well as well. And that's where I'm going to be keeping my focus. All right, so that's going to be the US dollar index. We're now going to jump right into the metals. All right, so let's actually look at the US, uh, not the US dollar card, gold and silver chart. This is the ratio between gold and silver. So right now you can get 98 point, let's say three ounces of silver for one ounce of gold. And this is extremely high. We have basically the highest point ever in history at 128 in terms of the ratio, not too long ago when we had that massive capitulation event back in March. And then from then we've seen silver do quite well where we had that first ascending wedge that broke to the downside, creating an unbelievable trade for silver that turned out really well. And we can also see a similar thing is happening right now. The first time we did not really get any pullback to validate the previous level of support right around here. That would have been the retest zone that we would have saw if we were looking for a similar situation like this but I am still potentially looking for that next major, major leg down in the gold and silver ratio where silver is gonna be looking phenomenal for a possible long compared to gold. Gold could probably be moving up, that's not a problem, but silver is a place to be in when this is moving to the downside. And right now, kinda of does look like it's topping out a little bit and uh, we got a series of higher highs and then some lower highs if we're able to make a nice rounded top. A potential breakout could be the 95 down towards potentially 87, which is the next major level of support. Just by looking at the two day chart, we can see major ascending zone. We see that this previous resistance is now acting as a strong level of support in confluence with the previous resistance right here. So definitely the 95 zone is very important, but if it does break below that with strong aggression, I think the next zone we could be looking at is around maybe 87. We see previous resistance, new level, of support right around there. We also see a pretty significant level right around here. It does depend on how far it drifts because the further it goes right, the higher it's gonna have the support obviously. So we'll see how aggressive it moves to the downside or how calm it moves. We don't exactly know, right? So that's the overall potential move that we're gonna have in my personal opinion. The momentum is very to the downside so we're gonna be treating the market as such. Let's just zoom out a little bit and let's just stick to the 12 hour on that chart. And now we're going to go on to silver. Really not much has happened on silver. I still have the exact same bias that I had in the previous video, in the, in the video before that. Uh, I'm long silver. I'm bullish on silver. It looks awesome. The gold and silver ratio looks great. As long as gold is able to hold its ground, I think silver will be a pretty good long. I got to take profit from the 
size of the symmetrical triangle as well as in confluence with the previous level of resistance just under twenty dollars so this trade is potentially a 3.7 rr which is pretty good giving me a little bit of uh hesitation not really seeing much bids coming into the market yet but gold has been extremely extremely silent not seeing any real movement here although we are holding the previous resistance as a new level of support which is good to see so this key level of resistance right here is now our new level of support so overall that is good to see um, although i don't really see any structure that would give me a good edge to personally trade on gold and that's why i'm mainly looking at silver not the only reason but um this is a little bit wonky <laughs> it doesn't look very uh clean in my personal opinion so you know i still have faith in the metals that it'll continue going up but i would really like to see gold go a little bit a uh, little bit higher and not consolidate before i look at gold but silver i'm already looking or i'm already in so that's my play we'll see how it goes i'm not really gonna even leave that there gold is a little bit messy as of right now we had a descending zone let's just try to clean this up a little bit by starting at the daily because this is a little bit messy here as you can tell in terms of the price action the daily is not so bad you got a nice major level right there that's going to be your key level of support. And then you've got also a minor level right there that we're looking at, which is acting as a nice support as well. And we're really hesitating to go above this level. And let's zoom in on that on the 12 hours, see what we find. A lot of wicks to the downside. That's really nice to see. We see a lot of wicks, a lot of wicks to the downside, indicating buy pressure coming into the market. Yeah. I'm pretty happy with it. When you go down time frame to time frame, you have a better understanding of what's going on. And I usually do that before I start the videos, just so I'm not going from the weekly to the four hour to the two hour every single uh, chart. But yeah, it's still holding the higher lows. So that's nice to see. And it's not really doing much other than holding those higher lows. I can't see a squeeze. I can't see wedges or triangles or anything. I see a consolidation and a failed break to make a higher high. So right now, I'm gonna assume that's a rejection and a failed breakout because we retested to try to go up higher. Could not, massive sell off, huge bullish engulfing candle, and now we're just consolidating sideways. And we could potentially see a market melt up uh, with an ascending wedge, we don't exactly know, or a channel. So I'll put that there, this is still unvalidated so this is not a valid trend line so we can make that nice little dotted but we'll see where it goes i'd like to personally see a squeeze here and i'm just going to see if i can put a trend line hmm let's see if i can put a trend line there so let's delete this and just extend that oops what happened there oh i don't know what happened back to gold so let's extend oh this is silver oh they're both silver i don't know what happened cool okay um let's get our oh my god i don't know what just happened i'm touching a button i don't know what i'm touching um I'm trying to get this off get this off get this off give me one moment here I'm trying to find the potential ascending trend on this connect going to connect those higher high or higher lows uh i don't like this it's too ascending it's a little too ascending for me maybe there's a little bit better Uh, I don't know. I don't absolutely love it, but we'll we'll leave that there, and then we'll do the top one. So if it does break to the upside, that's a potential ascending wedge structure breakout. But that's basically all I see for. 
gold and silver looks a lot cleaner. So that's why I'm in silver and not gold. And um, kind of take away this. We'll take away this, we don't really need it. And I might just leave it at that to be honest. Put a little midpoint right there. Awesome, okay. And then the place that we really don't want to see break is below this zone. And the place we would really like to see break is above this zone. Okay, so that's my goal analysis. Not a whole lot to do right now. It's just consolidating. I'd like to see it go up, pull back, and then continue going to like the 1800. Last low off top would be nice. That's kind of the target for gold is the $1,800 zone. Oh, wow, that's nice. Look at that. Okay, I'm going to use that instead. There we go. There we go. And then we got a large structure here. Okay, so we got a nice little resistance. And then we got a nice uh, ascending support and resistance. So we're just squeezing towards the apex. Ideally, we'd like to see it melt up. So then silver would be doing well. But if it does move to the downside, that definitely would be not great for silver. We're probably going to get taken out of the trade or just exit altogether because it's not going to be bullish if gold is bearish. Okay, so that's going to be my goal analysis. Looked great. It got a little bit messy. And as of now, I don't love it nearly as much as I used to. But silver is still a good play in my personal belief in terms of the overall structure. Got a nice retest from the previous resistance multiple times. Strong bullish candle. It pushed up, although there is a little bit of a wick there that was not ideal. I'd like to see the candle close near the highs or at the highs. That, was, uh, that would be awesome to see. But right now... Push, pull back, uh, holding the support zone in confluence with the horizontal zone and the previous descending zone, which is ascending zone. So yeah, silver looks uh, silver looks fine. This is the key level of support that I like to see hold, which it did. And then we're now above this zone, which is great as well. So silver still looks fine. Gold's moving up. Which is great, and that's all I want it to do. As long as it's consolidating or moving up, it's gonna give the option for silver to rally up. So I'm in silver, not in gold. I wanna see silver do well. I just wanna see gold consolidate or go up a little bit. But as long as gold's holding its ground, it gives the option for silver to rally, and I think that's gonna be the higher probable situation. And the gold and silver ratio definitely looks more bearish. So overall, just in terms of not just looking at one price action, one piece of price action, but looking at different assets and different ratios in order to get more of a broader perspective, I still think that silver is a good opportunity and I am going to keep it on probably over, or not probably, I will keep it on over the weekend. Although I'm not, uh, I might keep on some of the other stuff. Oh shit, odd is moving up, that's sweet. Okay, so getting the forex thing. So that's going to be the video for the global macro update. If you have any questions, drop them in the comments. We'll go over it right now. And then we're going to go on to the crypto market update in a little bit. Christian says 5 a.m. wake up on a Saturday for the stream. Let's go. That is awesome. Hell yeah. That's sweet, Christian. Love to hear. Um, yeah, that's, that's hard work, man. Good job. Love it. Also, do you snowboard? Because I said that I snowboard... Where I love snowboarding, I don't snowboard as much anymore just because time and snowboarding takes like a lot more of the day where you have to go for a full day. Whereas like mountain biking, I could literally go for two hours and it's not going to take up a whole day. So just curious if there's any other riders out there. Usually, I don't know, like people who trade don't ride as much. I don't know. I'm pretty avid sports enthusiast, I guess you could say. Um, newbies prob says, is this frozen? No. Alex said, buy Tesla. Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, I think, I think the car manufacturer is awesome. I love Elon Musk. He is a little quirky, a little odd, but unbelievable in execution and implementation of his ideas. 
It's unbelievable. So anyways, yeah, man, I had a season's pass for the year, but in Oz, oh, in Oz, but COVID made me feel like I've wasted. Yeah, that's really unfortunate, my man. Um, oh, I guess I totally forgot. <laughs> Winter's uh, right now down there, yeah. Um, yeah, that really sucks. I'm, I'm kind of wor worried about my uh my season in the winter here as well but yeah not much you can do that really sucks maybe if you can like ask for like a discount for the next season i know that a couple of the local mountains have that current system in place so if you already bought a season's pass for this upcoming winter and it's closed it's going to be i think 50 percent off for the next winter when hopefully covid is done so six degrees here holy shit six degrees celsius here yeah that's uh a lot different than here right now. All right, so let's now go into the crypto market here. Not a whole lot has happened, but we can still definitely give it a really good look. I'm gonna keep my chart on silver and then let's get right into it. Also, um, if you have any stocks, commodities, anything that you want to get viewed on TikTok as well as YouTube, um, it's a pretty, it's a Friday. It's a pretty relaxed session. So we'll just look at some stuff. We can look at some relative strength in cryptos or even in the equities market, like in indexes, we do offer or trading view does offer relative strength calculations within their ticker box. So that's pretty important. All right. So BTC against the United States dollar still holding that ascending zone of support. We did recover quite well from the move down on yesterday, I believe. Yep, yesterday. So we are recovering, although it does look like we are making a lower high. That's not great, but overall, we're not really moving much. And we are, have already talked about the desire for the volatility to decrease even further before we get the major increase in volatility. So before we actually get into the uh, charts here, because there's not a whole lot to talk about in my personal opinion, we're gonna get into this chart. So might look a little bit crazy right now, but I'll describe it here in a way that's easy to understand, hopefully. So what is this? This orange line right here is basically the price action of Bitcoin. It is divided by the Dow Jones, but this is going to be uh, basically where Bitcoin was during the peaks of volatility. The only reason I did that is because I wanted to have the Bitcoin chart and the volatility chart close together. If I just had BTC USD, this would be over 9,000 and this chart would be at $4.50. So I wanted something that was be that would be closer. So then BTC divided by Dow Jones. Dow Jones is relatively stable compared to BTC. So it just makes it look like a normal BTC chart. But going on to it, let me get a little bit of water. So we can see at the extreme lows of volatility, breeds extreme increases in volatility. So ideally what we're looking for is we have the highs where we have high volatility and that's represented by these rec red rectangles. And then we have extreme low volatility that is represented by these green rectangles here. And then we got the red line and anything above that is high volatility. And then we got the green line and anything below that is low volatility. And what do we see? We really only see two points on the chart that had extremely low volatility. We had back in October of 2018, this was before the 6K breakdown where we had that nice triangle here within all of summer and fall of 2018. Everyone, including myself, thought it was actually gonna go up. Um, absolutely got, uh, it, it just dropped like a, like a freaking brick. So anyways, before that, we had extremely low volatility, right? Ooh, let's just go back right here, this is Coinbase. So this is the time when we had extremely low volatility, right here, right? And this is where we had the lowest amount of volatility. What happened after that, right? We got a massive, massive expansion in volatility. This is the type of stuff that we're looking for. We want to trade this. We want to make money in this. It's really hard to make money in this. Unless you're an extreme short-term intraday trader, it's pretty hard to make money on this because nothing follows through. There's a lot of wicks. I just don't really love it. I'd rather trade in trending markets. So what we're looking for is a trending market. The other time that we had extreme low volatility was right here, right? 
And what happened after that? We had a massive move to the upside, continuation pattern, and then a rally. Massive move to the downside, continuation pattern, rally. So what we are looking for is the volatility to decrease even further below the 450. That would be ideal. It's already at 437, so I guess it is already under 450. But we're looking for it to dip significantly under the zone. We see here it dipped a little bit, came back, retested, and went back further to have even less volatility. So what we're looking for is to see an extreme in one direction to the downside, which will then create the other extremity to the upside, where you're going to have both extremes. When we had the extreme low volatility, it breeded high volatility. When we had extreme low volatility, boom, 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 we have extreme high volatility, right? And it's not like if you have low volatility, you should go long once it, there's high volatility. That's not, you, you gotta look at the chart and the story behind it. And when we can see right here, we're near a high of a major zone. We're nearing the lowest point of volatility we've seen since March of 2019. And when we look on the weekly chart, let's just zoom out. Just looking at it objectively, which way do you think that the market's gonna go? I personally think it's probably going to go down uh, in terms of where the expansion and volatility will go to. That is going to be the initiation of the momentum. We don't need to catch the first crack of the consolidation. I don't need to. I'm totally fine with waiting for a continuation pattern and then entering on the continuation pattern to carry the momentum to the downside. And hey, if it does move to the upside, uh, my bias is wrong, but I can still make money because I'm going to look for continuation patterns to the upside. This is how we use volatility in order to try to find situations where we have a high probability of the momentum continuing extremely in our favor. So I think the setup is not ready yet, but if we do get a lack of volatility reduction in the price action movement for a little bit longer, I think we will see the next big major move in crypto here. But right now it's not there, so there's not really to go over there's nothing really to go over, but we will be looking at this uh in great detail to make sure that we are in line with um what we're trying to understand here. So a little bit of uh the buyers and sellers. Not a whole lot has happened, not a lot of buyers in the market opening positions, not a lot of uh sellers or buyers really opening up any positions whatsoever. And not a lot of open interest, basically. If there's not a lot of price uh, movement, there's not a lot of open interest. So no surprise on that one. BTC market cap, looking like it could potentially, or sorry, this is the BTC dominance, not the market cap. So this is Bitcoin dominance. Also, I'm gonna quickly look at the questions here. Uh, G32M, do you use Bollinger Bands? So I do not use Bollinger Bands. I know that they can help with seeing that increase and decrease in volatility because you know there's like a setup in Bollinger Bands when you see the contraction Bollinger Bands and then once you see the initial break of that consolidation within the Bollinger Bands that's the momentum that you want to carry towards the intended direction that you're looking to target off of but I do not use Bollinger Bands uh, they can be useful but I personally just like price action and key levels of significance both using trend lines and horizontal zones but Everyone is different. Um, Evan also said, "Is this ETH?" Nope. So what we're currently looking at is right. Uh, what we're currently looking at right now is the market cap for BTC dominance. Another way to put it is the BT, uh, Bitcoin dominance chart. So what this shows is right now we're at around, we're at around sixty five percent in BTC dominance, meaning out of the entire cryptocurrency market, if you added up the value of every single project in the cryptocurrency market, BTC, Bitcoin, would have 65% of that value. So BTC has a shit ton of market share compared to any other crypto that you can think of, including Ethereum. And that's why BTC has such high liquidity. And usually if you're an institutional investor or trader, you're mainly looking for high liquidity. Because if you have a hundred million dollars to invest. Do you want to invest in coin market cap listed coin number two five five? Of course not. There's like 
a hundred million dollars in the entire market cap. If you bought it with that investment, you don't own every single coin, right? That's not feasible. So you need to find high liquidity, high volume assets in markets if you are an institutional trader. And BTC and Ethereum are basically the only alt or only coins, all uh, Ethereum being the only alt that, in my opinion, major institutions are wanted want to take a part of right now. As the volume grows, obviously people will be able to trade them and invest in them because there's a reduction in the slippage and there's a reduction in the spread between the bid and ask. But right now, I just think that BTC and Ethereum are really the only two places that major institutions are going to be looking due to the liquidity and the volume that they currently have. Um, Christian says at the end, can you look at Ethereum? Yeah, sure. So we can look at Ethereum right now. And what we did is, uh, we did a, let's just quickly get it here and go to our crypto market analysis. So this is what we did yesterday, I believe is we went over an altcoin analysis video where we went over relative strength and the TA of a bunch of different altcoins. And we do provide this for our Performante Premium students. And this is the structure of how we actually do it. So um, let's just go on this one. I don't really know why I even have this open. So we're looking for Ethereum. Oops. Excuse me, I uh, burped a little bit. And then what we're gonna do is we have Ethereum on one side, and then you have your Ethereum paired with BTC. So you're comparing Ethereum with BTC because BTC is the benchmark in my view. All right, so let's first look at the price action of Ethereum and then we'll actually look at Ethereum compared with Bitcoin, Ripple, different alts just to get a good understanding of how Ethereum is performing, not against the United States dollar, but against other similar assets that are somewhat positively correlated. Some are more than others, but then you get a good understanding of relative strength and weakness from a technical standpoint. So let's go back to the weekly chart. And this is on a log scale. First thing I noticed very simply, $86, $85, or 86.95, somewhere around there, the around $10 range, very, very important level for a base. We can also see a major level right around here at just under, let's say $300. Let's say $330 to $300 is right now the, the major consolidation we're seeing right now. So we're going from a high to low, high to low, we're at a high, made a lower high than the previous high and the previous high and the previous high which isn't great, but we can draw a trend line here and that will create our descending trend line resistance. That's not really red. That's a little bit more red. And we can go like here, get our little projection zone and then draw that in. That's gonna go a little bit further down, just like here. And I think I'll just leave that there. That's not the end of the world, okay. And then let's get our projection project that outward, try to line it up. Okay, awesome, so that's the weekly chart. We're at a high. We got a lot of supply near the 280 to $300 zone. We've made on the weekly chart a lower high than the previous high, and that high was lower than the previous high, and that high was lower than the pre, or same high, but then the, overall we're making lower highs in our consolidation zone which is an extremely wide range, but cryptocurrencies are pretty damn volatile. So we are trying to attempt to make a higher high and it does look like it's failing. On the weekly chart, very important zone I see at around 219, 220. So even on the weekly chart, we have a good understanding of what could potentially play out, right? So this is already setting up to be a potential head and shoulders if we do get some bearish momentum to come into the market. What would, we, what would we need for that? Well, we need the price to come down to the low of around 180, come back up to around 220, and then you got your nice head and shoulders play that you could be looking for. So just even in terms of the weekly chart, the market structure is looking like it is hesitating to move to the upside. When we are looking on the daily chart we can draw in another ascending zone like so and 
we'll just make this a lot lighter and go like that to oh that's the other way around okay awesome and then we got another zone right here that we are looking at right around like that and that can be a little bit more red that can be a little bit more red okay perfect okay so uh right now Got a consolidation above major level of resistance. We are forming a descending triangle pattern. And then we also have an ascending zone that got broken as well right there. So it's definitely looking a lot more bearish for Ethereum in my personal view. So we already broke the ascending zone. That's a shift in trend to now a consolidation sideways. So now we're viewing the market in a consolidation with the resistance and support. And what I would ideally like to see is something with a break and retest where if you're looking to enter a short, it's just too early. You're facing a very significant support zone at around 217. On the flip side, if you're looking to long, I still think it's a little bit too early because if you are entering, it could very well break down and then you're losing a lot of money. That's not fun, that's not enjoyable, that's not good for your investment goals. So in my opinion, in this current market structure, it makes sense to either break to the upside where you're definitely going to see BTC break to the upside as well or at least consolidate and you're going to see the SPX and overall stock markets do well as well and that's the environment in which you want to be looking to capitalize on altcoin boom. On the flip side, if BTC moves to the downside, if stocks move to the downside, if overall risk tolerance is reduced and it's a risk off environment, this will probably move to the downside. How far? I don't exactly know. But what we're looking for is a break and retest similar to what we have right here. This is the current or this was the previous structure, market structure right here. What happened after that? You got the previous market structure support to act as a new level of resistance before making a massive sell move to the downside. You could be looking for ascending zones. You could be looking for ascending wedges. You can be looking for channels double tops, just simple retests, whatever your strategy is, that is what you're gonna be looking for. But in terms of the overall structure, I think it's the safest bet to either wait for a retest after breaking to a new high or waiting for a retest after breaking to a new low. So let's get our little bars pattern and let's get this guy right here. So we don't exactly know, but um, I don't think it's going to be as aggressive. Actually, we, we shouldn't take that one because I do not think it's going to be as, as, as aggressive as uh, one may think. So we'll just take this. We'll see how that looks. Yeah, that could potentially be a play out. So when we zoom back. And then we are forming, if you actually really look, higher lows. So this is a low, this is a higher low. This was a massive rejection. Hmm, maybe if we go like this, resistance, support, support, right around there. And that would be eh, somewhat close to here. Yeah, 128, yeah, we'll see. I think anything under 150, is a pretty damn good price for BTC. Because this is 150 right here. Let's take this off, let's take this off. You're buying in here. That's awesome, that's a good buy in my opinion. Yes, it could go down more, that is completely something that could happen. But in terms of the price appreciation potential and where you are averaging in, in terms of your dollar cost averaging within the larger structure, which is this, you're averaging in the last, let's say quarter or a third, ideally not half, but a third or a quarter. So you wanna be averaging in, in these lows when it breaks 150, 140, that's when you wanna be looking to dollar cost average in my personal opinion. So we'll see, I'm pretty optimistic about it, but in terms of the short term, I don't want to be too optimistic because the S&P doesn't look awesome. It looks all right, but um, I'm going to take it day by day, right? That's basically the end goal for me or week by week, I should say. All right. So that is Ethereum in terms of the USDT chart. 
like I said, I don't really want to be looking at entering until it breaks the market structure. I don't want to be entering on a consolidation or else I'll just be holding for a while, maybe take me out of the stop loss and then go towards my direction. I just don't want any of it. I'd rather wait till the momentum starts so then I can get in so I don't have to have such a long period of drawdown while I'm in the trade. All right, now we're going to be looking at the, let's just look here. Uh, this is going to be the Ethereum versus BTC. We'll look at Ethereum versus a lot of different coins as well. But firstly, we're going to look at Ethereum versus BTC. So first things first, major level right around here. We can see previous level of support turning a new level of resistance. But what's interesting is Ethereum compared to BTC looks extremely, extremely bullish. Right? We see a very, very nice squeeze right here with a series of higher lows and also a series of lower highs. And it does look like it broke here. Let's go like this, Resist or support resistance. I'm gonna call it not a, not a breakout just yet. I like to wait for a little bit more confirmation. But right now, it does look like we are creating a nice squeeze within Ethereum. So that's our resistance zone right here. Let's get that red. And then we got our nice little support zone right at the high. If it breaks this zone, I think we could see a little bit of a tumble. So it's all it's all together, right? So if this goes down, it makes sense because overall the crypto market is probably going to be going down as well. If BTC falls, alts almost always fall at a faster rate with more aggression. So if this falls that way, BTC is probably falling too, but Ethereum is just falling at a faster rate. But if it does break to the upside, that's pretty bullish for Ethereum. So that's going to be the first zone right here that I'd like to see pass. So let's get our little thing right here. So the price could consolidate in here. I don't like to enter right when it breaks. I like to look for a market structure break as well. So this, so I want to see it make a higher high and you're looking for a higher low. It could be at a higher low from this previous resistance. We don't exactly know. So it's not there yet, but that would be the structure I'd be looking for if you are looking to enter Ethereum instead of BTC. But overall, Ethereum does look like it is recovering quite well from its move down back in June of 2019 to around July of 2019. So it does look like it's recovering. It made a nice low there and it's now, it's now making a nice symmetrical triangle, which is a potential continuation pattern to the upside. So... Ethereum is looking like it's ramping up for a potential move that is going to beat Bitcoin in price appreciation. But let's look at Ethereum versus Ripple. Or actually it might be XRP Ethereum. All right, so what does this chart show you? It shows you that overall, if it's going down, XRP is worse than Ethereum. If this chart is going up, XRP is better than Ethereum. Technically speaking, in terms of relative strength and weakness. So we did get a pretty big move up in 2018 for XRP, but overall, what are we seeing? The overall trend is back down. Ethereum is beating Ripple in relative strength. That's what it's showing me. Let's look at another one, BNB Ethereum. Binance coin is doing a lot better than Ethereum. Holy shit, right? So what does this tell you? Like at the start here, 2017, BNB was outperforming Ethereum by a long shot. Right now, we broke below key level, oops. We broke below key level of support right here. We're now at a major level right now. We'll see how it reacts to that zone. Because key level of support resistance, it was a wick low there. And now we're consolidating at that zone. So if it breaks this zone again, like we saw here, Consolidate, 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 break, and then you start trading in the next range, which would be this level of support right here. So that would be the next trading range between 0 0.065 and 0 0.055, let's say. Once it goes in there, that just basically means that Binance is not doing well as Ethereum. You want to be in Ethereum if this is going to the downside. So right now, Ethereum is actually doing really well compared to a lot of these other alts. So let's look at another one. Um, let's do ADA Ethereum because ADA Cardano has been doing really, really well recently. Wow, overall, Cardano is doing better than Ethereum recently, but overall, it's been pretty stagnant. It's been pretty sideways. So if you're putting your capital in Ethereum versus Cardano, 
you're not really winning or losing. It's going sideways, so they're probably both going to appreciate at a similar level. But then now it does look like ADA is moving to the upside. We got a very nice squeeze here with a symmetrical triangle breakout, very clearly shown right here, right? And then you get a massive move towards the upside. So ADA is a really good place to be parking your capital right now compared to Ethereum. But Ethereum overall is a great, great investment in my personal view. But uh, when you are talking about relative strength, Cardano is doing better than Ethereum. So let's talk about more Ethereum here. Uh, if you would like me to compare something to Ethereum, go for it. But we will be going over different um, alts in order to compare with Ethereum. So let's do Link Ethereum because Link is one of my favorites. Binance coin or Binance, sorry. So we can see Chainlink is doing a lot better than Ethereum. It's not, it, I'm not saying Ethereum is a bad investment, but, or, or even trade, but I'm just saying when you are selecting alts, this is a really good way to understand relative strength and weakness. Yes, you can read about the project all you want. You can read about the development team. You can read about the roadmap. You can read about all these different attributes that the company will do. But what this represents is what has the price done? Has the price been appreciating? Has, been, has people been purchasing this compared to another alt, right? Like a lot of people are gung-ho about XRP. Everyone loves XRP, it seems. But it's crazy how shit XRP is. I don't want to be mean, but... Uh, it's not a very good investment. Um, to be quite honest with you, Neo is recently doing better than XRP. Obviously, this is when XRP is doing a lot better, but Neo is doing better than XRP. Uh, a lot of these other currencies are doing better than XRP. Let's do Adam USD versus XRP USD. Yeah, Adam was doing worse, but now Adam's doing better since I guess kind of the middle of Q1 here, or I guess end of Q1 March. But yeah, um, yeah, you can put some more if you want, or you can look at uh, different alts if we want, but that's basically the end of the video. We can kind of play it out with uh, whatever relative strength weakness analysis that we would like to conduct, but right now, I am going to close off the recording. So thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you have not already, it'd be great if you would subscribe and like the video. It does help us out tremendously. And if you are interested in joining a friendly community of traders, entrepreneurs, people who are in the digital entrepreneurship space, I guess you could say, definitely join our Discord. You can find it on our website, perfomonte.ca, absolutely for free to join. Over, I believe, 2,000 people. So... There's definitely a good community there, a lot of friendly discussions and overall a good place to go for all kind of general crypto talk, general trading talk. It's overall a good space. So that's going to be the video. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, have a good one.